sorry about that. My cat just like destroyed my headset. <laughs> um, anyway, no worries. Uh, Welcome to Under the Lens. Come and enjoy an extraordinary, raw, and unfiltered podcast that delivers debate, discussions, and interviews about film, pop culture, and everything in between. Here is your host, film critic and journalist, Byron Lafayette. Today I had the pleasure to sit down with game developer David Schmansky. You may know him from such hit games as Dusk, Iron Lung, and the upcoming stealth horror FPS Gloomwood. In this sprawling conversation, David and I discussed many things, such as what horror films still scare him, his love of classical music, and what it takes to be an indie game developer. I truly hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with indie game developer David Shemansky. So, you know, um, I guess like, you know, kind of a first like fun question, um, you know, what kind of uh, video games have you been playing lately? Oh, let's see. <clears throat> well, I just got finished up playing um, 133 hours of Elden Ring. Oh, very um, nice. <laughs> So, uh, mostly I was playing that. Um, and then I've been pretty busy... Uh, the le- sorry, I'm getting I'm getting um, Discord messages suddenly while I'm talking. Oh, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll respond to that later. <laughs> anyway, so uh, and then I've been pretty busy the last few days after finishing that, so I haven't really uh, settled on something else to be playing in the wake of that. I've also been streaming Dark Souls because um, Elden Ring kind of pushed me down a From Software rabbit hole. Uh, so that's that's sort of what's been dominating my last I don't know last month or so. Oh, very nice. You know, it's uh, um, I've been thinking about diving into Elden Ring myself because uh, almost all of my friends have been playing it, and it's like, you know, I was kind of holding back because like I'm just you know I'm I've never really been a huge like Dark Souls style uh, fan, mm-hmm. but everything I've been seeing about Elden Ring just looks so spectacular. I'm like, I think I might just have to have to dive in. Yeah, I think it's the best game I've played this decade. It's mm-hmm. really it's really spectacular. Um like it uh it's pretty much unprecedented for me to have a first playthrough of a game like like be 133 hours or anywhere close to that. Usually at about uh, I'd say around 15 hours is about my maximum for a game, even games that I really enjoy. Usually that's about the point where my, you know, my ADD kicks in and I want to go play <laughs> something else. So, yeah, it's oh. it's pretty incredible. I, I am very similar, you know, that uh, that I'll play for um for a little while with something and then I'll jump over over to something else. Like I've been that way with uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I think I just hit like the 90 hour mark and uh, mm. getting getting near the end of it. But I was like, I'm going to press through, even though like I'm starting to get that itching feeling to go to something else. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happens with me, too. <laughs> man well you know what uh what ended up like uh, getting you started with uh game development and made you want to to go in that that uh career path um let's see one second here sorry i was just quickly replying to a gloomwood message <laughs> i realized it's kind of unprofessional but no, uh, hey, he, you had know. A, he had a quick question that i was hey, anyway no, no. um this type of an interview it actually it adds to it you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I'm like I'm just like on call at all hours of the day because we do as as we discussed before the recording started, we do everything to Discord. Mm-hmm. So, it'll just be like, you know, I'm giving my kids a bath or something. It's like bloop, bloop yeah. question. <laughs> um anyway, uh sorry, did you ask what got me started in game development or gaming in general? You know, I, honestly like uh, an answer to both of those would be great. <laughs> Um, well, I guess it's kind of the same thing, honestly, uh, now that I think about it. Um, it, it was Mist. I'm actually staring at, uh, five different Mist posters right now in my office. Um, it's one of my, one of my favorite games ever, cause it's what really started my whole love for, for a lot of stuff in games. Um, when I was in, uh, in elementary school, I was like obsessed with it. 
Um, and we were learning this piece of software called Hyper Studio in the in computer class. I have no idea what kids have now. If ki- like if kids do have computer class, but ba- back then <laughs> we had computer class, and it was on these ancient computer. Like even for the time, I think they were pretty outdated. But um, we were learning Hyper Studio, and it's basically a presentation software, kind of similar to PowerPoint. Uh, mm. I don't even know if that company exists now. I don't know if that is still a thing but uh it was you know it was like a slideshow software and it's very similar to um hypercard which it may have even been just a a later rendition of hypercard i'm not sure but uh hypercard is what was used to assemble mist because mist was basically just a whole bunch of photographs a whole bunch of uh like pictures a whole bunch of renders um, that's what made up the game world. And so they assembled it all in HyperCard, and that's basically what the game was made in. And one day it just suddenly clicked for me that, like, wait a second, like, I love Myst. We're learning Hyper Studio. I could, like, make my own game sort of like Myst in Hyper Studio. Um, so I did that, and it kind of didn't turn out great, but it was a game that I made. Um, and that's what got me on the path toward learning, um, the, then I learned Microsoft QBasic, which is this really kind of um, underpowered, uh, DOS era programming language. And I made a few ASCII games in that. And you can actually get those, uh, now, um, if you buy Dusk82, I included those in the goodies folder there with like DOS box to make them playable and stuff. If anyone's really interested in seeing like the beginnings of, <laughs> you know, where I started things, um, awesome. And then moved on to like when I when I went to college, I ended up moving into working in Game Maker, and then um, when I or sometime after I graduated, I started with Unity, and Unity is where I actually kind of started um, game dev as a professional career. Yeah, that's really cool, you know. And uh, yeah, because you know, it's everybody. I always love hearing about everybody's different journey of like how they start with either gaming or game development. It's, it's mm-hmm. really interesting. You know, it's like, you know, for, for me as a, as a kid, you know, my dad would take me to work with, with him and, uh, and to keep me occupied, he would, uh, he would turn on, um, it was a descent to, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> keep me, keep me occupied on, and I think it was like a Pentium three, I think, um, you know, uh-huh. it was just, it was, it was just something that just kept me occupied for hours and hours. <laughs> it was just like such a cool, cool thing for me at that age. Yeah, I've never played two. I've played some of Descent one, mm-hmm. never two though. I think yeah. I own it somewhere. Yeah. It, it was a fun game, you know. I, I I have been thinking about revisiting it over the last few years, but I was kind of scared because I have just this kind of like nostalgia glasses, you know. Yeah, that is that is scary. I revisited Mist, um, actually, and I, I guess a couple different ways. I because the remake well the like fourth remake of that game uh came out recently um and it's for it's for uh, vr also so i like replayed it there and i also have played some of the original recently too and it's like some ways it doesn't hold up to my memory but some ways it does and sort of it's a bit of a bittersweet experience but it's also interesting to like to revisit that and i i feel like it it doesn't take away from the memories because like the the way the game affected you it, like even if you play it now it doesn't like take away from that um but yeah it can be kind of like oh this isn't quite as you know as amazing looking as i remember <laughs> like i remember miss just looking you know mind-blowingly realistic and you go and play it now and it's like these super low res uh limited color palette renders of these <laughs> It, these environments that you know at the time in uh what was that 90 um 93 i think it was 93 mm-hmm. yeah um at that time you know at that time it was like absolutely cutting edge 3d renders and they could only do them in uh you know they could only be renders you couldn't do that at, at all in real time and now of course you know anyone with a uh anyone with a pc and uh, access to the internet you can download unity and make something that has higher fidelity than that yeah. in real time it's kind of crazy <laughs> It, it it really is, you know. I, I revisited um, Half Life Blue Shift um, about mm. a year ago because that was one of that was one of the first like you know shooter games that I was introduced to. And Underrated I remember, expansion, in my opinion. Very I liked so. Blue Shift. It was yeah. I, I always felt that uh, I, I liked it a lot better than Opposing Force, and it yeah, was, it was good. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of there. Opposing Force added a lot of cool stuff, but it was mm-hmm. sort of like a 
a kitchen sink approach, mm-hmm. in my opinion. It just threw everything in. But anyway, I guess that's kind of uh, off topic. <laughs> this is what happens. I'm good. I should I should have warned you in advance that um, I always talk a lot. So whatever, however long you expect the interview to take, it's probably going to take longer. <laughs> Hey, you know, it, it, it's, it's no worries at all. Cause you know, the, these type of interviews are always my, my favorite, you know, cause, mm-hmm. uh, cause you always end up, end up, end up learning and talking about things you didn't expect. And, and it, it, it makes it a lot, a lot of fun and interesting, you know? Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, I did that with, a uh, um, with Rob Liefeld one time we were talking about like Deadpool and then we ended up going uh-huh. to this rabbit trail talking about like X force for like 20 minutes. And oh, okay. <laughs> it was super, it was, it was, it turned the, the interview was great though because of it. So, so don't mm-hmm. worry about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you um, you know, I, probably like one of your one of your most well known games, you know, is uh is Dusk. I would say the most well known uh-huh. by a huge margin. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and and you know, what was kind of the inspiration for for that game? Because it's it's so cool, you know, and it's so like it's so much fun to play. And just like what what kind of put that seed into your head to to start making that? Um, so I got this. This works pretty well with the last question, I guess, because the uh the game that I was obsessed with in elementary school was missed. And then when I was a, you know, young teenager going into middle teenage, teen years anyway, um, I got introduced to shooters and I think I can't quite remember the exact order of things, but I think, um, I think chasm was the first one that, uh, game like very few people have heard of called chasm the rift i found like some shareware for that on one of those old shareware discs that had like you know 200 game 200 uh pieces of shareware on it or whatever i remember Um, those (laughs) yeah and then around the same time um my cousin got me into old like 90s games this was this is around the, like the two, this is the 2000s, like 2003, 2004, around that time. Um, so these games weren't new. Like I, they, I wasn't playing these when they came out, but like we didn't have a computer that would really run anything new. You know, at that time, the new exciting stuff was like Doom 3 and Half-Life 2. And I was like obsessed with looking at, <laughs> uh, screenshots of them online. They just looked incredible to me. Uh, but I, couldn't run them so what i was actually playing was like shareware for you know from the 90s like doom and quake and uh duke nukem 3d and also uh i remember uh what is that game depth dwellers that was actually one that i ran across which is that's that's one that even fewer people have heard of that than chasm i think uh lgr has a review of it like a really really old video where he reviewed it and it's just absolutely terrible but you know stuff like that I love um, his that I was finding whatever I could find for free online. Um, and one th- thing I, I fell in love with all these games and that whole style. Um, but in particular, one thing that I really resonated me with me was actually the visuals. And this is again, this is like 2004. So this is the time where Quake and Chasm and stuff. Um, would have looked old, but not retro. They would, they just looked, you know, outdated. Um, so, but for some reason, that blocky look, like that quake look, especially, really resonated with me. And I just desperately wanted to make a game that looked like that. Um, and I spent a lot of time kind of thinking about and designing in my head this game I wanted to make, which at that time I actually named Dusk. That's where the name came from. Um, and tr- tried to make it in QBasic, which is what I knew at the time, and I just didn't. The QBasic was not powerful enough to do anything like that, and I was not smart <laughs> enough to yeah. write my own 3D renderer, so that, you know, never really went anywhere. Um, but then fast forward to, you know, years later, when I'm working in Unity, and Unity takes care of all the 3D rendering and stuff, uh, I'd had a couple of moderately successful horror games that I'd put out uh, and I'd gotten myself burnt out on making horror games or, or making those sort of horror games, I should say. Uh, and one day just kind of fell into this first person shooter prototype, this you know, quick graphics looking thing. And I'm like, Hey, maybe it's actually finally time to make that game. 
Man, that's awesome. Cause yeah. And like so many, so many of the mechanics of it are just like so much fun, you know, the slide, you know, you know, it's just like, you know, I'm sure a lot of people mentioned that, but, uh, yeah, all of that was just kind of like people ask, what made you add the flip and stuff? I'm like, I don't know. I just thought it'd be fun. Uh Like, like I, I was experimenting with all this stuff that I'd never done before. You know, I'd made, uh, other Unity games and I'd made other games in general, but I'd ne- never made a full 3D like polygonal FPS before. Um, and so it was, there was just all this stuff that was really experimental and, you know, new. And so my brain's already working in this space of like, what other crazy new stuff can I try? And so, you know, one thing was like, oh, hey, I've never seen a game do, you know, make it so you can like flip in the air. Uh, that'd be pretty cool. I think at one point I, had it set up that the flip in particular had it set up where it was like you press space while you were in midair and it would automatically flip you upside down or something like that. <laughs> it was really janky and weird. Um, but same with the slide where it was just like, Oh, Hey, it'd be really cool if you other games had done that. That wasn't like super new, but I was just like, Oh, you know, slide, that'd be really neat. I wonder if I can make that work easily. And I could, you know, it's just that sort of thing. Or like, hey, I'm gonna, what if you have a bed you can sleep in? Like, why, why would you do that in a retro FPS? I don't know. I just thought it'd be cool. <laughs> oh, you know, and it, it felt like, you know, with, with Dusk, it felt like there was a lot of like, you know, kind of like Lovecraft, uh, you know, influence to that. Um, yeah. You know, is, uh, is that a, a type of like a horror that you, that you like? Yeah. In a, in a way, I, I think the, much like a lot of things, the modern perception of what Lovecraftian means is maybe a bit different than what Lovecraftian actually meant. I know this was a, this was a, an annoyance I had for a while with retro FPSs because for a while, uh, in like, I don't know, <coughs> excuse me, you know, the, uh, late, the late aughts and stuff, people would be talking about retro games like Serious Sam or Painkiller or, uh, even the Shadow Warrior remake in the early, uh, in, in like 2013 and stuff. And they're being like, oh yeah, this is like back to, back to basics sort of shooters. I'm like, that's not really what shooters were like back then though. <laughs> like, I love all those. Well, I'm, I, I'm lukewarm on the Shadow Warrior remake, but I love Serious <laughs> Sam and, um, and Painkiller and stuff. But it's like, those aren't quite, those aren't really like what Doom was. You know, you don't have the level design, you don't have the really bespoke elements of the enemy placement and all this stuff. Um, I feel like there's a bit of a similar phenomenon when it comes to Lovecraft stuff, where uh, there's a lot of new wave Lovecraft stuff I do really like, but it's definitely a case of like, oh yeah, Lovecraft, that means like weird tentacle monsters <laughs> and like cos- cosmic, uh, you know, cosmic deity lore and stuff. And... The stu- the part of it that I really like is the unknown aspect. Mm-hmm. And that's what a lot of Lovecraft's actual writings were pre, you know, um, the Cthulhu mythos, mm-hmm. which I think he did help write, didn't he? I don't, <laughs> I, I think he and another guy wrote that. Anyway, that doesn't matter. But, um, like it's the really the mysterious, you know, you're just getting this glimpse of some unknown horror mm-hmm. element that I like about Lovecraftian stuff. Not so much the, well, I guess, I mean, even Dusk is, is, you know, guilty of this, where we have Nier Lethotep, the god that you're shooting with a super barrel, super, <laughs> super shotgun, double barrel shotgun, and like, it's a boss battle, and you, you know, that's, that's, that's not really Lovecraft type horror, but. No, that, I mean, that it's is, still fun. That is very true what you said of like the unknown. Cause I, I can't remember. I think it was, was, it might have been at the mountains of madness. I think where like he talks about the character turning and looking behind him and losing his mind, but you never <laughs> actually know what it is. Like he doesn't yeah. actually tell you. you know, it's, it's it's in, mountains of madness is a really interesting one too, because that's like one of the few stories he wrote that was really, really focused on that Cthulhu mythos element and went, went like, really uncharacteristically hard into explaining stuff behind it. Whereas a lot of his stories were like, Oh, here's this weird thing that happened that a friend of a friend of a friend told me about. And you know, it's, it's just, they're basically creepy pastas from that day. Like they were meant to be, uh, something that you could read and be like, Oh, this could actually be real. Like, you know, that's why there's so much annoying detail to things that we read it now. And we're like, wow, this is really dry. And like, there's, there's so much unnecessary detail and it was all to build up this idea that, you know, this has, uh, 
you know, this has like a basis behind it. This could actually be a real thing that's out there. And uh, describing it as as that era's creepy pasta is probably like the most perfect <laughs> description of like yeah. Lovecraft I've heard. <laughs> that's yeah, it kind of was, and some of them are really uh, go really hard on that. Like the <laughs> the whole scary part about it is just supposed to be that. <laughs> that feeling of like, Oh, this could be actually something that happened, which is completely lost nowadays. Of course. <laughs> it's very true with, with, with hor- horror has really lost that, you know, which is, is, is kind of too bad, you know? Um, Cause there is something that can be extremely scary in those type of stories if written properly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think that's probably part of the reason that f- for whatever reason, the only horror movies that can really get to me now are like found footage. Mm-hmm. as far as actually creeping me out and i know found footage is one of those subgenres that is sort of like looked down on and i can understand why because there's a whole bunch of found footage movies that are just sort of crappy blair witch rip offs and stuff mm-hmm. like that but for whatever reason that format like gets to my brain and like creeps me out there is something about those because I think it's I, I don't know it, it gives that kind of like POV you know um, mm-hmm. I don't know feel to it almost like you're there I don't know so yeah it's, it's kind there's of, a, an immediacy to it mm-hmm. no I I would agree with you that there is that there is definitely there is definitely an aspect of that that can get to you uh, way more than some of the other ones can I don't know yeah. it might, might be the immersiveness to it so. yeah that's probably part of it also it would mm-hmm. be really cool to see a horror movie that's well actually there have been some like this kind of um, like uh, a horror movie that's in first person but it's not really like there isn't a found footage gimmick it's just it's in first person mm-hmm. um, but I think uh, what was that movie um Chernobyl Diaries. That's it. That one was kind of like that. That was also that was a kind of a terrible movie, also. But it, it did the thing where it was filmed like a found footage movie, but there wasn't actually a found footage gimmick. It was just that's how it was filmed, uh, which was kind of neat. You know, and I, I feel like a, it's not really a horror movie, but like, uh, what was that one that kind of did it almost like it? It, it was like you were looking through the person's eyes. I think it was was it searching? So, I think it was. Um, might have been searching. Oh, really? Was, yeah. I don't. I haven't heard of that. I was thinking of like uh, hardcore Henry. Oh, or... yeah, yeah. Because searching was kind of like it was a guy looking for his missing daughter, but he's doing it all via the computer screen. So you're only ever looking at his computer screen. Oh, that sounds cool. I should, yeah. was it good? I really liked it. Yeah, I found it was a good movie. Um, okay, that sounds yeah. like something I would really like. Yeah, uh, and it's him, like, that's two things that creep me out. <laughs> <laughs> like the. Uh, online horror stuff and <laughs> found yeah, like first person footage horror. Yeah, I think I think you might like it if, if you're into like the found footage type stuff. It, it, it you know, I I never found it to be super, you know, like you know, um, like overdrawn out or anything. They kept the tension mm-hmm. up really well. Um, and like I said, it really wasn't horror, but I thought it was it was pretty well done for what it was what it was doing. I yeah, I'll definitely have to check name. that out. Mm-hmm. That sounds right up my alley. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that, uh, um, since you were talking a little bit about like dusk and the, and, you know, changing some stuff up and everything, it remind me, you know, in this era of like, you know, everyone's like doing like remasters of games, you know, kind of how you were mentioning mm-hmm. of like the remasters of, you know, of Duke Nukem and everything. And, you know, they're remaking stuff and everything. And I loved that you actually did like a D make of dusk <laughs> in 2021. <laughs> like, yeah. I love, you read the other uh, and, you know, um, like, where did that kind of idea come from of like, I'm going to take this all the way back, you know, um, to, to that style of game? Um, so that was from a couple of different angles, I guess. Um, like I mentioned, I started out making like ASCII games in QBasic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were, uh, I spent uh, not just making like QBasic games, I also spent a lot of time kind of, browsing in that community and the games that other people were making uh which were the, you know a lot of i was really interested in ascii stuff I w- i've always been a bit of a minimalist at heart and so that idea of like making a game with just ascii text or, or with like you know ascii characters was really appealing to me um and one of one game that always stood out to me as one of the better ones was this little game called uh now i gotta get the name right it's is that I think it, that one is Dark Woods. There's a modern game called Dark Wood, I believe, 
or it might be the other way around. But <laughs> like, I can't remember which one is Dark Woods and which one is Dark Wood. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's yeah, Dark it's Wood. A, I think isn't that the, like the Diablo style? Um, that's like the top down horror yeah. game thing. Mm-hmm. I think, mm-hmm. um, or it's the other way around. I, I can't quite remember. But uh, it's this little. It, it's actually very similar to Dusk eighty two. Uh, I kind of I ripped the. AI behavior basically straight from it. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> that was a game I remembered and I revisited it like within the last few years before making Dusk 82. I was like, oh, let's just see how this holds up. It's actually on, um, archive.org. Uh, if you type in Dark Woods, you can find it and its sequel. And it, it was like, it held up actually really well. It was a really fun little puzzle game. Um, and in the wake of Dusk, I, was and maybe to a certain extent still am sort of trying to find my footing again uh re- releasing like dusk 82 and iron lung has definitely been helped a-, a long ways to feeling like i've regained that footing but it was really hard to figure out what do i do now after spending you know however many years of my life I f- it was like three years i think or more on dusk and having it you know come out and kind of explode in popularity and stuff it was a bit hard to figure out what to do next and to keep myself busy i did smaller projects and that's kind of what i'm still doing is i'm doing smaller projects while working on like gloomwood and stuff uh and i happened to find that on steam they had done a re-release of uh chips challenge which I, i think that's a game a lot of people my age probably remember playing in like school libraries or whatever, um, which is another, another old, you know, puzzle game. And I played some of that and play, you know, I grabbed the re-release version and played some of that and was like, this actually kind of holds up also, not in all ways, but it's, you know, it's still, there's something very satisfying about this whole adventure puzzle game style where it's not quite like now where you play a puzzle game and it's really, really a puzzle game. You know, it's just, like designed around the puzzles and stuff. It's like, it's kind of a little bit of a, like a level based adventure game, but also it's really puzzle focused. I don't know. Something just stood out to me about it. And I started thinking about, you know, it'd be really easy to make one of these nowadays. Um, just make a l- tiny little puzzle game for fun. Uh, and it, f- kind of, it quickly, I was like, you know, what if it's dusk themed? And originally I was just going to make it on my own and, you know, just this fun little dusk themed game to release to people. And then, um, Dave kind of had ideas for what purpose it could serve us, uh, with new bloods, with new blood stuff. And so then it became a new blood game. And then as we're working on it, it's like, oh, you know, this is kind of a, a prequel <laughs> in a way. Like it's, it's like a, a dusk prequel. So that's kind of how that happened. It was just. I wanted to make a fun little puzzle game and little by little, it turned into a dusk prequel. Man, that's really cool. Yeah. Cause it's, um, I haven't played dusk 82 yet, but yeah, it's like, it's going to be going to be definitely one I pick up. Cause it, it, it just looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. It's one of my favorite games that I've made out of everything. It's definitely, I don't think it's the best one, but it's the one that I'm kind of most proud of in a way, just what it represents. It's just a little, little puzzle it's re- returning to you know my childhood making games like that i think it's really fun for what it is and i really like the um community modding potential it has because you can you can do all sorts of stuff with it you know really easy to use level editor it's got the workshop support it's got really easy sprite replacements so you can make all people have made you know uh ultima like a, a ultima tile set <laughs> or like a donkey kong country tile set and all sorts of stuff yeah it's just I, I'm I'm very fond of it. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's definitely it's very cool. You know that I, it's funny that you mentioned uh, um, you mentioned Iron Lung. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because uh, first off, you know, congratulations on it on it uh, getting really great reviews on Steam. I think last Thank I you. checked, it was like ninety five percent positive or something. Yeah, it's, sadly, it's dipped. It's now ninety four, <laughs> so it's no longer oh. overwhelming. But that's fine. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no, that, that's the way it goes with the Steam reviews. Yeah, you know, it's like you know, like, I mean, oh. it's you, you like it's kind of a a trade off. You can have less reviews and 
a higher score or more reviews and a, a lower score. And I'll, honestly, I'll take the more reviews because that means more sales. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And also, you know, some of those negative reviews, somebody will be like, the submarine's color is brown. I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. So, sometimes they're, they're like, eh, uh-huh. you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. You know, and when I, you know, when I was playing that game, you know, it was, I, I kept thinking to myself, but the very idea for like Iron Line shouldn't work in a video game, you know, being in this small mm-hmm. single enclosed space, no outside view. The only view you have is a still camera, but it works mm-hmm. so brilliantly and it's really <laughs> perfect. <laughs> it's like I, and I was just thinking, man, this is, this is just, this is just excellent, you know? Mm, so thank like, you. Well, That's a big part of why I wanted to do it or the, do it the way it was because it's mm-hmm. like as i said i've always been kind of a minimalist at heart and the prospect of like can i make a game where you can't see anything <laughs> like is it, like with it can you make this interesting that's like really appealing to me to try and do yeah because you know that's what i yeah that's what i was actually gonna ask you i was gonna be like what made you decide you know on like those mechanics because it was just it was it was so creative <laughs> yeah um let's see well they the central idea like to start with was always like it'd be really creepy if you were like in this submarine and the it wasn't always the only view i don't think i think it was like the most like like the the only real practical way of like seeing stuff out there would be to take pictures and so you're seeing these grainy pictures of like a monster or something um and then on developing that and iterating on that it just it it just kind of originally I was like oh maybe you have all these different tools for navigating that aren't visuals like the camera is only one of them mm-hmm. uh, which I still might expand upon if I ever do a sequel but it eventually just turned into like yeah okay what if you just have to move around with the map and coordinates and it's you know you're just hearing these noises and stuff and how how much can I get out of that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, because it was it was very cool. Like, you know, I always loved that, like, as you were navigating, basically, that you could, you know, that you could take pictures like anywhere, basically. Yeah. And so, like, I was going to I was going to ask you, like, you know, so does does that mean like the game world that you created? It's like it, it I'm trying to think of the word like it's dynamic, like it exists outside of the of the sub that you're going like everything you're taking pictures of is there or is yes. it all being created for for each photo that you do? No, it's it's all there. It's a fully rendered world. Mm-hmm. Uh, that said, there I mean, there is some stuff that isn't actually like rendered there, like stuff that you wouldn't ever actually see. But all of the stuff that you're seeing on camera is a literal 3D object in the world. Well, except for the one thing, which isn't a literal 3D object. It's a, <laughs> you know, a, a quad. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, that's a, I, I've gotten that question a whole bunch and it's kind of taken me off guard because, um, I don't know. I didn't expect that people would not assume that, it, you know, it was all rendered. I figured that would be the assumption. Um, but no, I've, uh, a lot of people are like really surprised to learn that it isn't a bunch of static pictures. Uh, yeah, because it, it was it was interesting because, yeah, because when I was playing it, like my first thought was like, OK, this this must be like a fully rendered world, you know. But then I like wasn't 100 mm-hmm. percent sure. And I was like, I need to ask him about that. <laughs> yep, fully rendered. I mean, I guess the uh, I, I guess I guess the smarter. Well, maybe not smarter, but the more um, cost effective way to do it would just be of made them all static pictures and the game probably would have taken, you know, like a month less time <laughs> or, le- or more. Uh, but I also think that it's way cooler to have it all rendered because mm-hmm. part of what's cool is not to me at least. Um, and I kind of wish I would have done a bit more with it maybe. And maybe in a, if I ever do a literal follow up, I might do a bit more with it is the idea of you can take these pictures anywhere. And so you could in theory capture anything on the pictures, you know, originally I did want to have kind of the threat always swimming around you Mm. or not always swimming around you, but like swimming around you dynamically. And you could in theory catch it on pictures. And it was just, I mean, if, if I would have, I think if I would have known that iron lung was going to do as well as it had, I would have spent the extra time to get something like that working. But at the time when I was working on it, I was like, I don't think this is going to like, but I didn't think it was going to do that well at all. I thought maybe a few people would play it and it'd be like this niche little horror game. Um, And so I kind of just wanted to experiment with the concept and get it out there and not spend a whole bunch of time iterating on something that potentially was you know 
that no one was going to like. Um, which in hindsight, you know, uh, again, if I'd have known it was going to do this well, I probably would have made sure to hide more stuff you know, and things like that. But at the time, I figured that it was just going to be wasted effort. Um, which I, I don't know if that was the right way to think or not. I'm still kind of mulling that over, given how how unexpectedly well Iron Lung did. I'm, I've, I'm kind of mulling over decisions I made during the development to figure out, okay, was this a good decision or should I have, <laughs> you know, done this or this, you know, part of that, the in endless learning experience of releasing indie, indie games. No, you know, it, it's true. And it's like, you know, I, I loved a lot of the aspects of like Iron Line of like some of the stuff that was surprising, you know, that it was mm-hmm. like, you know, because it had that kind of uh, that feeling of uh, like dread, you know, um, yeah, cause, cause there's not necessarily, you know, um, any like jump scares. A hundred percent. There are a few. Well, there. there's <laughs> the one, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like which has been the most I, one of the most divisive aspects of the game, actually. And that's that's like the first actual jump scare I've done in a horror mm-hmm. game. Um, so it's been really interesting to see the responses to that. And that's another thing that I'm still kind of mulling over and like i don't i'll you know trying to decide if that's something that i'd want to do again or you know whether that was a good idea and stuff um because it's yeah it's been the responses to it have been divisive like i've actually gotten negative reviews because of it uh oh which my is, <laughs> yeah um that's weird. Yeah, it's, wow. it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't have definitely like you know. I I, I liked that part. I wouldn't have thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that people would find that negative. Um, it's definitely unexpected, yeah. but I think that's yeah. Kind of I think kind some people though. see it as kind of cheap and anticlimactic, <laughs> which I I can see where they're coming from. I guess to me, it felt like an appropriate way to end the game. Mm-hmm. Um, having it just you know, it's sort of like a it's a sudden end that that felt appropriate to me, but I can understand people being really disappointed and feeling kind of cheated by that. So again, just, you know, one of those things that I'm like letting my, letting my brain work on for, you know, if, if uh, this question ever comes up in future projects, like, should I do this or should I not? Then I have this information to work of like, well, here's how people responded to it in this context. Yeah, because you know, I, I I always felt that the ending, like you said, it 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 made sense, you know, to me because I think mm-hmm. that you know, because there was a part of me that that thought there was going to be a different ending because, like, you know, when you kind of get the clues to the backstory a little bit, you're you know, you're you're kind of thinking it's going to end a different way, but then it kind of it ended exactly the way the main character said it was going to end, you know, <laughs> so mm-hmm. kind of you know, so it worked. Um, yeah, and the interesting thing too is in games in the past, I've also gotten. I don't remember if I've gotten negative rev- reviews, but I've definitely gotten negative comments uh, about like people being disappointed that there wasn't a climactic jump scare at the end. <laughs> so I don't know. People are uh, people as a whole, like players as a collective whole, are are a uh, little hard. It's it's hard to please everyone. <laughs> It is definitely, you know, and especially when you're on such a large platform, especially as like Steam or something, you know, there's yeah. always going to be some people that aren't happy with something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what, um, with like Iron Lung, like one thing I was curious that I did want to ask was like, um, what, what made you, uh, what made you decide, you know, when you were kind of coming up with your game world and, and your story and stuff, um, you know, what, what made you to decide to go with an ocean of blood? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't remember, to be honest. Uh, it is, so I don't want, I don't want to reveal how much of the story I have planned out, like the, the story in the world I have already planned out and how much, how many of the answers I don't have Mm -hmm. planned out. Um, cause there is some of it that I do have answers for that aren't Mm. revealed in the game, but there's some of it that also is just kind of, um, you know, I wasn't really sure. I just put it in because I thought it was cool. <laughs> uh, but that one was that one was just sort of a random idea I had that then um, that then developed into a part of the world. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's definitely cool, and you know, it, it was definitely a game that that I enjoyed a lot. So I, I definitely hope maybe at some point in the future, you know, maybe we get like a Iron Lung Part Two or something. Yeah, I have <laughs> a bunch of ideas for what. So I that world actually was something I had the idea for before Iron Lung, and while you know working on 
or while, while like iterating and developing the concept for Iron Lung, it was like, wait a second, this would be a great candidate for taking place in that world. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do plan on revisiting that world in some way. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it will be a literal direct Iron Lung sequel though. Mm-hmm. I don't, that, that I'm still thinking about because mm-hmm. there are, there's definitely other stuff I could do with the whole gameplay concept and, mm-hmm. and stuff, but I'm not sure if it would be a good idea or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I do plan on revisiting everything in some way. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Cause I, I think the world that you created for that game was, was, uh, was very cool. And it was Thank you. The, the hints to the, to the greater catastrophe and stuff. Uh, I, I enjoyed And it was something I really hadn't seen before in, in, um, in a sci-fi game. So, so it was cool. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so um, you know, uh, moving on to your uh, your game that you're uh, working on right now, uh, Gloomwood. Um, yes, which I'm know. a co-developer on. That's <laughs> that's actually more of a, a Dylan Rogers game than a David Szymanski game. I'm just I'm just there to help out, basically. Hmm. Well, how... I'm happy to talk about it though. Just wanted <laughs> oh. to make sure I'm not credited as like the Gloomwood guy because yeah. <laughs> it's really not my baby. <laughs> oh. How how did you end up getting involved in that project? <laughs> Um, so let's see, um, if I can, if I'm not sure I have the timeline quite right, but some, at some point while working on Dusk, I met Dylan on Twitter because of seeing screenshots of Gloomwood, which, um, didn't look anything like the Gloomwood that exists now. It was, uh, (laughs) uh, it it was like a roguelike pixel graphics sort of game it, w- it was very different um but i thought it looked pretty cool and so we kind of started up a friendship and then a little bit later while getting toward the end of dusk um we were pretty good friends uh by that point and i needed some help with some things so he assisted on some stuff in dusk um i think with a, a couple of programming problems and he helped design the boss arena when i uh, the final boss arena when I was kind of stuck on that. And um, I think he helped out with the block out for city of shadows also, if I remember correctly. Um, so he helped out on dusk anyway. And then after dusk released, I was kind of camp. I gloomwood had changed forms by this point. Um, it had turned into more of a system shock Two influenced game. It, you know, it, it had turned into a proper immersive SIM. Um, and I was like, Hey, you know, the, Dave, uh, Dave Oshry, I was like, Hey, Dave, this, this game's probably going to be pretty cool. This is my friend working on this. Do we want to make this a new blood game? Um, and then I think randomly at some point we just invited him into the server, like even before we played a, a build of Gloomwood, which would never happen now, by the way. That's <laughs> that, that, no, <laughs> um, but it was just like, oh, hey, we're talking about immersive sims right now in chat. Let's invite Dylan in since he's the immersive <laughs> sims guy. Uh, and so he, and, and then luckily when he finally did a build, everyone was like, uh, yeah, we could, this, this should be a cool new blood game. <laughs> it would have been really awkward <laughs> if we played and we're like, oh no, actually this kind of sucks. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, it was just like most door, of, you know? <laughs> yeah, like most of early on new blood, it was very, uh, flying by the seat of our pants is just like oh yeah uh, invite dylan into the server he's like friend this is cool and oh yeah sure we'll do that game which really is not how stuff works now but you know at the at the that time um where we were still growing uh it was just yeah it was, it was very um very spur of the moment yeah, because it seems like you know when I was lo- I was looking it over on uh, on Steam and stuff, and it and it definitely seems to be like a a, a fairly ambitious game in the sense of, yeah. kind of like the world, and you know it's going to be like survival but explorative, you know. Yeah, it's pretty ambitious, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. I think our uh, uh, the time it's been in dev definitely shows that, but we're we're making it. Uh, we're what we've got is pretty cool, and we're making sure to give it the time it needs. Um, and luckily. In the case of Gloomwood, there's more than just one or two people working on it. Like with Dusk, it was like me and um, Dave overseeing and Andrew doing music. And then um, for the most part, I was doing all of the game. Like it was just me. And then, you know, QA, QA guys working on finding bugs and stuff like that. And 
um, and a separate team working on uh, Dusk World because I was not prepared to handle Dusk World. <laughs> Still, I'm not, to be honest. Um, but yeah, with Gloomwood, it's like a whole bunch of people working on on that in different roles, which is good because it's a much bigger game. Yeah, definitely. Like the the whole like the whole theme of it, you know, just looks like really cool. I, I love that kind of like that that Vic, almost like Victorian era. Yeah, uh, you know, I know it's like a sword cane in there. I was like, oh, that's yeah. cool. You know? Dylan is a huge Bloodborne fan. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you could tell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Never would have guessed that. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh man oh well, that's cool De- definitely looking forward to uh to that one and uh you know and i always appreciate too when when devs you know take the time you know to work on work on their games because i would imagine that yeah. sometimes you know there's a feeling of wanting to get it out as soon as possible but then you know yeah. you also want to make sure your your product is quality you know yeah well there's there's some people without naming names there's definitely some people who are really disproportionately angry at us for not having released gloomwood yet we're just like do, do you want a you know do you want a super broken game like do, do you want the game to just not work you're not going to be happy then either oh uh, no you know it, it's it's very true you know because like i i, I kind of think of um which one was it it was a uh, uh, warhammer 40k inquisitor martyr um and it was like you know and they they worked so hard on that game and they released it and there was so many bugs and there was mm. so much broken stuff and, and yeah, there have been a couple of uh, immersive sim releases recently that were uh, fell into that, which I'm you know not blaming the devs. Like it's mm-hmm. you can't always blame the devs for stuff like that. Sometimes it's just a really unfortunate circumstance. But yeah, there've definitely been some um, other immersive sim releases that's <laughs> like we don't want to be like this. That would <laughs> that would be bad. Mm-hmm. No, exactly. So I think it's, I think it's good, you know, and stuff. Cause you know, th- thankfully the, the Warhammer 40 K guys, they went in, they revamped everything and it's a fantastic game now. Oh, know? nice. You know, so that's a, always a good thing at the end, but you know, yeah. but yeah, it, it's, it's good taking, taking your time, you know, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We so do like- not release anything before it's ready at new blood because we <laughs> oh. don't have to, and it doesn't do anyone any good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, exactly. You know, cause you know, cause you know, with, with a, with a smaller company and stuff, you know, you, you rely on word of mouth, you know, and, mm-hmm. uh, and word of mouth yeah. is the most powerful marketing, you know, and it- our reputation too. Mm-hmm. Like our, our, the, we have a reputation now for releasing really, really high quality indie mm-hmm. games and like it is not in anyone's best interest for us to uh us to harm that <laughs> <laughs> no exactly you know and you know it's like as a i noticed that you know um that you know as well as you know doing like game developing and stuff that you also do like uh composing as well yeah that's mm-hmm. actually what my degree is in oh really um, mm-hmm. yeah yeah i got a useless college degree in uh <laughs> well actually yeah, i guess technically in violin performance mm-hmm. um because i switched colleges before i finished the composition degree but yeah mm-hmm. composing is is perhaps the thing that i am most uh what, what's what would you say like the thing i'm most educated in but it's not the thing that i do as, <laughs> as a job so <laughs> uh. <laughs> I, I know that feeling exactly. You know, I got my degree in political science, and, uh, and, and now, oh, now really? I, yeah, now I work in in, in writing and marketing. So yeah. like, you know. <laughs> that's a, I feel like that's a very common story for uh-huh. people like in in our generation or younger. It's like mm-hmm. uh, you get a you get a college degree in something <laughs> that you don't use and then you're just paying off the debt uh, it, it, it is it's the it's the way it goes you know and uh, yeah. you know, it, it is kind of funny you know but um but yeah you know it's like with your with your composing you know it's like um you know um obviously you know music has always been like an interest you know to you, you got your degree and yes. such um and uh um, what kind of instruments do you play um i play violin and piano mm-hmm. oh, very nice uh-huh. i'm actually quite good at violin uh it's <laughs> One of the one of the one of the few things that I would say I'm I'm unironically pretty good at. <laughs> Most other <laughs> things I'm kind of like uh, just stumble my way around and, um, but you know, again, not a thing that I'm really doing anything with. Hmm. I, I've always like you know I've always loved the violin, and it's like it always mm-hmm. seemed seemed to me like it would be something that was like difficult to play, and it's like it's, yes, yeah. <laughs> it is it is extremely difficult because you're. Um, there, there's a reason that if you go to like a, maybe not so much like an actual adult orchestra, but if you go to like a, a youth orchestra or something, you'll, you'll see like the, all the other, you know, winds or brass players or whatever they've been playing for, I don't know, 
few years, you know, a good a few years. And then the violin players, it's like, oh, yeah, I've been playing since I was four. Um, <laughs> and it's because you have to contort your body into a shape that it was not meant to go in. And then you have to like, you like, you have to get your muscles to go into this shape that they're not really supposed to go in. And then you have to relax them in that shape. And mm-hmm. then you have to do all of these really high speed, high dexterity, you know, finger movement, arm movements and stuff while you're in that shape. Um, it's, it's not, I would, I would encourage if someone was like, what instrument should I play? I'd be like, probably not violin. It's not very ergonomic. It's not a, not a, not an instrument you can really play without fear of, uh, you know, tendonitis in your future or whatever. <laughs> oh, you know, that is very true. I, I never would have thought of that, but yeah, the way, the way you're positioned your arms and fingers that I would, yeah, it's ridiculous. Would be- I cannot tell you how much of my time in like, later on in in learning violin was just spent trying to get my body to relax Mm. and in doing these things that it just it does not want to relax while doing and that's really kind of what makes a really good high level violinist is being able to do that we do uh off the beaten track a little bit but um but Mm. with violin do you have a uh, do you have a favorite uh classical composer uh yeah i'm actually really partial to aaron copeland even mm-hmm. though he's sort of like uh normie music in a way <laughs> but i've always realized his uh symphony number no. three is probably my favorite classical piece um and who else i've always really liked minimalism which is uh in the, in this case i'm talking about the a specific 20th century movement so that'd be like uh philip glass and steve reich and guys like that um, a lot of, tw- I like 20th century stuff, like early to mid 20th century classical music, uh, mm-hmm. is really where most of my music knowledge is. And that's really cool. You know, and, uh, <laughs> it, it's always nice to, uh, to, to talk with somebody who, who appreciates, you know, classical music, you know, cause sometimes mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, don't always appreciate, you know, that style of music, you know, it's a weird niche and the, uh, I could talk a whole bunch about this, but, um, I'll, I'll keep it. Short, I guess. Like, um, at New Blood, we've got Andrew, of course, who's a, you know, extremely successful, uh, composer. And we have Hakida, who is, I, I would say, also a successful composer, although he's primarily a, um, <coughs> primarily kind of known as the ultra kill guy right now. And uh, neither of them have any educational background in composition. Um, I, I know more, like music theory and stuff like that than them combined, but it doesn't matter because like a bunch of the stuff that I learned in college in a, as a, with a composition or getting my composition degree, it turns out is actually pretty useless in the larger scheme of things. And is really only something that's important to know in that specific niche of like classical music, Mm. Um, which I, do harbor a little bit of bitterness about, but ultimately there's not really, you know, not really much that can be done now, but it is, you know, sometimes it's very frustrating where it's like, I spent all this money and, you know, all this time and stuff learning, uh, learning this area of music that ultimately is not actually that relevant to being a actual working composer in the larger creative world. Mm -hmm. That's really, that's, that's really interesting, you know? And, uh, yeah, I think sometimes it, it seems like, you know, in, anywhere with like theories, you know, especially in school, it kind of goes that way sometimes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And even in, yeah, like, I think it's part of a larger, you know, a, a larger phenomenon in academia, which is academia being kind of will, willfully divorced from the act, you know, the world at large and kind of in a lot of cases taking pride in that and looking mm-hmm. down on people who are not part of that small insular mm-hmm. academic community. No, you know, there, there, there is truth to that. Cause you know, I mean, just, you know, in like kind of the writing world, you know, sometimes like, you know, I, 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 I write like a, um, a lot of like poetry and stuff. And so I, mm-hmm. I kind of like interact with people who are, you know, in that, that subsection of the literature world. And it's kind of interesting that sometimes you see like a lot of the people who are the most successful in like the poetry world are people who have like no training in it whatsoever. Yeah. You go to school, whatever. It's like, they'll have a best selling book. And then, you know, I'll, I'll have somebody else who's like spent, you know, 10 years studying poetry and they can't get published. Um, and, you know, and I feel so bad for them, you know, cause their stuff is great, but it's like, you know, it doesn't always work that way, you know? Yeah. It's really interesting. That is a very common thing in a lot of 
creative fields that also have a academic presence. You could say it's it's a thing in gaming too. Like sometimes people ask me, like or not gaming in in game development. Like sometimes people will ask me, you know, where did you go to school to learn game development? Or like, hey, I'm in I'm uh, in school for game development right now, and my imp- i i don't want to speak for everyone but my impression certainly has been that like getting a degree in game development is sort of like throwing your money in the toilet at least if you're i don't i don't have any idea what like corporation like triple a companies or whatever look for yeah. i have no idea but in indie development if you're if you're planning on going into indie development and your career path idea is yeah i'm going to get a degree in this to go into indie development, I would say that's, uh, that's, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyone I've ever known who went to a school for game, for a, um, for a game design was ended up regretting it mm-hmm. or it ended up not being a positive thing. No, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very, it, it is very true because sometimes, you know, when you have that kind of like, I don't know, that, uh, that work experience, I don't know, just kind of like jumping mm-hmm. in, you know, um, it's like, I, uh, I almost think of what was it, uh, um, oh, what was the guy? It was, uh, it was the famous YouTuber. It was, uh, uh Freddie W, I think, okay. um, that he like kind of talked about on like a podcast that he, he, you know, he'd worked on all these like YouTube videos and stuff. And then he kind of said, like, looking back on his time, you know, he's like, I was very successful. I had a great time with it. But he's like, I really kind of like should have put that time into doing like indie films, you know, <laughs> instead of like, huh. you know, cause he's like, if I would have done that, he's like, I probably would have about like half a dozen indie horror movies out. And he's like, I might be a, like a big name in that field, you know? Oh, instead interesting. Of, instead of like the direction he went in and stuff. And it was, it was kind of interesting. Interesting. Um, it was like a podcast two years ago. And, um, and at the end of the day, he was like, Hey, you know, I had my experience. It was great. I wouldn't trade it. But he's like, you know, he's like, maybe, <laughs> you know, may- maybe he was like, if somebody else is doing what I'm doing, he's like, maybe do this. <laughs> <laughs> right. <You know? laughs> but, um, but man, you know, I. Uh, it's very cool. But that, um, what you kind of said actually kind of led into, into kind of my, my last couple of questions of, you know, of like, you know, there's a lot of people who, who, you know, want to get into, you know, the, the game development world or, or who want to get into, you know, like writing games or, you know, um, or any, any of the aspects of, of making a game. And, um, what kind of advice would you, would you give somebody, you know, who, who is just kind of like, Hey, this is something I decided I want to do. Um, but they haven't really done it. They haven't really like started moving into that world yet. Hmm. Um, let's see. I, the, the more I work in, in indie development, the less I like giving advice because the more <laughs> I feel like I don't actually know anything. Um, but I would say, uh, well, first of all, don't listen to advice. Uh, second, <laughs> no, uh, um, I, I would say don't plan on the first thing that you, you work on being a huge success. Um, and I, the the common advice is don't quit your day job which i always hated like uh, as a uh when i was younger i hated that because what i took that as as uh, i took that as someone saying yeah you you may not actually find success um but i would say it is good advice and it, if you take it in a different way which is don't quit your day job um because it will t- it even if you find success, it's going to take, it could take you time. Uh, it took, could take more than just one try. Um, and as, yeah, in, in games, I, in indie development, when, when I talk about games, I just mean indie development. Cause I, like I said, I have zero experience in anything larger. Um, <clears throat> but you're, you're kind of rolling a roulette wheel a lot. And, Iron Lung's a great example of that. Uh, a big reason that Iron Lung was as successful as it was was not because I released Dusk and not because I did anything particularly, you know, smart or unusual with its marketing. It is literally just because some uh a YouTuber who's I I wish I could remember their name. They it, they did a really good video on the game and it wasn't a let's play, it was a analysis video where they hmm. said several times like go buy this game, it's incredible or something to that effect. Um, and that video just happened to be somehow picked up by the YouTube algorithm and kind of like go nuts and got a whole ton of, it had like several million views last time I checked. 
Wow. Um, mm-hmm. It just went everywhere. And because it was usually Let's Plays don't actually give you that much, um, don't, don't actually result in that much direct, uh, you know, direct, uh, what, what's the word I'm trying to say? Conversions. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Usually they're, they're just more like, you know, they're nice exposure, but they don't result in that many conversions to people buying your game. But this was an analysis that was specifically like, go buy this game. <laughs> um, and that's the main reason that uh, Iron Lung did as well as it did. And that was entirely down to luck. Luck on my part and luck on that guy's part, because his channel was like, you know, real a modest little channel, but he did this really good video and it ended up getting picked up. And I remember both of us were like independently like, wow, what the heck is happening? <laughs> like, why is he was like, why is my video getting this many views? And I was like, why am I suddenly getting this many sales? Um, so anyway, that long rabbit trail to say that like luck is definitely a big part of the industry. Um, but that should not dissuade you from trying. That doesn't mean like, oh, it's just all random. There's no, you know, nihilistic. There's no point to anything. <laughs> what it just means is that you may need to persist a little bit before you find that luck. Luck is a function of persistence. You know, if you keep trying and you keep putting yourself in a position where luck can happen, well, then you're that much more likely to have that luck actually affect you in a positive way. Um, so yeah, all that to say, like, don't, uh, I hate saying absolutes, but I, but, um, in this case, but I think you are, you are running a risk if you decide to spend, um, you know, three or four years on a massive, massive game that has to be a huge success for you to continue your career. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's what I would say. That is a risk. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when you're starting out, at least, it makes a lot more sense for you to start out small and start out doing a lot of games and, you know, start kind of building up your presence and your library and stuff that way. Um, my other av- advice would be, uh, let's, how do I word this? Uh, it's been kind of shocking to me as I've had more of a career to start to realize how many voices there are on Twitter in game dev circles that are held up as being these kind of respected sources of sources of information, um, but are completely wrong or, and (laughs) don't actually have that much reason to be held up in that way. Um, And I, I definitely do not mean discount everyone who's trying to give advice because there are some people who have very good advice and they're speaking from experience, but I'd say be cr- think critically about who you were listening to and don't get caught up in the, the Twitter dev culture of like trying to impress other developers and trying to like to play that game rather than just, you know, making your games for other players to buy, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. No, um, that does. And yeah. yeah, I guess those would be my two biggest pieces of advice. Other than that, it's a still a fledgling industry. It's indie development as a career has really only been around for. Sorry about that. My cat just like destroyed my headset. <laughs> um, anyway, no worries. <laughs> uh, indie dev as a career has really only been around for like, eh, I think even maybe a decade at this point, which is nothing in comparison to other creative fields. Um, and so everyone is still trying to figure things out and this, there is still like wide, wide open spaces for new things to be tried and people to find new ways of succeeding. Um, so yeah, uh, I would say be, be careful with what you're doing. Like don't put all your, don't put all your chips on one. I, I don't know. However roulette works. I don't gamble, but <laughs> um, <laughs> don't, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, be prepared to have to try a couple times and not just have everything work out immediately and be creative with how you're approaching things and be ready for you know to be to make good on success and to weather through failures i think that's excellent advice and it's so very true what you said you know don't don't put all your eggs in one basket you know because i i'm reminded of you know the uh the case you know of uh of a uh, kurt shillings with uh project copernicus and kingdom kingdoms of Am- amalar mm-hmm. you know 
Yeah, yeah there are a couple yeah. specific. <laughs> I'm not going to name names, but there are definitely a couple specific examples I'm thinking of of mm-hmm. developers that um, really ha- had a really unfortunate experience with working on something for a while and having that just fall through. There's one in particular I'm thinking of where it's like, what well, if that game had come out? when it started development which, i mean it couldn't have you know they just started development but it's like if it had come out at that time it would have done amazingly but because the the indie market changes so quickly like it's on a year to year basis things are changing um by the time it actually did come out after being a few years in development it was just like it it didn't do nearly what it needed to do that's unfortunate. Oh, and it's always sad sad to see, you know, yeah. you know, you know cuz like I said, you know, people put a lot of work into it, you know. <laughs> Yeah, no. and money in some cases mm-hmm. too. And that's when it's really unfortunate, where it's like mm-hmm. they they put all this money into the game, also that they're now in debt for. It's like, oh lord, I'm so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, you know, it, it's true. It's like you know, it's what they say. No, nobody sets out to make a bad movie. You know, it's no. like the same with a video game. You know, yeah, like man but uh but yeah it's all, all all great advice you know and i really appreciate you taking taking the time out to to chat with me you know about uh about all this it's been really great <laughs> man so yeah but, but like i said i really appreciate appreciate your time and I, I really enjoyed our conversation a lot <laughs> yeah thank you not a problem at all <laughs> mm-hmm. Man, yeah, and definitely, you know, whenever whenever you have a new game out or anything like that, you know, I'm more than happy to uh, to t- try and give as much uh, as much spotlight as I can to it. So, okay, yeah, yeah. Man. All righty, man. Well, I'll let you go because uh, I'm sure you probably uh, have a, have a lot of a lot of important stuff you need to do with your work. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, not so much work. I need to go uh, go do family things. Mm-hmm. Gotta go <laughs> rescue my wife from our children. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, well th- thank her for uh, for lending you over to me for this. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll do. <laughs> All right, man. Well, like I said, it's been it's been a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Thanks for mm-hmm. having me on.